Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. We know that New Orleans attracts many tourists, but just how many depends on who's doing the counting. This week, we saw reporting about the strategy behind the numbers. Some of those tourists will be coming to town to see Hamilton, Broadway's most popular show. This was another sign of the city's revival as a theater town. We'll look at those stories tonight, as well as who is supporting whom for the presidency, player shuffling at the Saints and the Pelicans, and the latest on LSU's benched basketball coach. On stage for us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Aboard, producer of Informed Sources, Stephanie Grace, columnist, New Orleans advocate, Fletcher Mackel, sports anchor, WDSU-TV Channel 6, and Tyler Bridges, reporter, the New Orleans advocate. We go to Tyler first because you're the one who did the reporting about there's a, a, a difference in the number of tourists that are coming to town. It depends upon what firm is doing the counting and who they're counting. Yeah, back in, in 2010, there was a, a consulting group report came out said that by 2018, the year of the tricentennial, that New Orleans would have 13.7 million tourists. And the city indeed changed that, uh, reached that level, but only because they changed the uh, counting firm that, that uh, came up with the survey that said that actually in 2017 there were 17.7 million uh, visitors, whereas in the, 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 the company that had been doing the counting uh, in New Orleans said in 2017 there was only 11 million. So again, they, they, they reached the, the, the count that they uh, were above the count that they wanted thanks to changing the surveying firm. Well, who did the changing? Why did they do the changing? And who did they change from to? Sure, the, change, the decision was made by the tourist leaders, hospitality industry leaders, Steve Perry and Mark Romig. They say that they made the change because the State Office of Tourism had made the change. And they went from the UNO Hospitality Research Center, and that was not a group known nationally, whereas they went to a company called DK Shiflet and Associates, which is known nationally. So again, there are a number of, uh, many more people are now coming here because of the way they're counting. Okay, so explain that. I mean, what is the difference then in the county? Because that's a, that's a pretty big difference there. There's millions of people we're talking about. Well, it, it depends on who you decide to count. And one of the ways that this new firm counts, let's say you're in uh, Slidell, and you say, let's go hang out in the French Quarter today on a Saturday. That would be counted as a visitor to New Orleans under the new way of counting. Under the old way, you had to leave at least, live at least 50 miles away to be counted as a visitor when you came to New Orleans. But the fact is, we know, no matter how you count it, there's a lot of people coming to New Orleans. There are a lot of visitors. Yeah, but and, and it's not just an academic question. The, mm -hmm. the tourism industry right now is, is under a bit of attack from the mayor, who is saying, hey, we, I, we need more of your tourism dollars that you guys are getting, the convention center, the uh, New Orleans and Company, the people who promote tourism here. And uh, if you can come up with a bigger number, saying that many more people are coming here, that gives you more weight, political weight, to fend off the mayor in the amount of money that she's trying to get a take away from that industry. And also, I mean, those numbers um, have an impact on what the city has to prepare for in terms of services, et cetera, for like public safety and then also infrastructure. Um, so those numbers really do mean something. They do matter a lot, yeah. And, and also in terms of the actual dollars that are generated. Um, now the the UNO research team, um, why didn't they count people who were really area residents as a visitor? Why didn't they feel that was necessary to do? Yeah, and, and, and just you know, one other point is mm -hmm. another difference is how much money people spend mm -hmm. and the new way that they're counting. They say that if somebody, uh, their airfare, train, uh, gas money, all that would count as part of the visitor spend in New Orleans. That's a little hard to understand. Whereas again, the UNO Hospitality Research Center said, how you got here, that's not counted. That doesn't count as amount the money that you spend in New Orleans. Because that money's not spent locally. It's exactly. Spent to American Airlines. It doesn't impact. Question, I apologize. Mm -hmm. How do other cities, does, you know, does San Francisco count people that come from across the bay as tourists, or Miami come from people? Or do, do you know, do other cities use it, this way of doing it, or do they only count? The, the way UNO did it. Yeah, there, there are different ways to count. And, and, and again, um, I think it's fair to say that the tourism industry has a bias to come up with a count mm -hmm. that is the highest number. Now, they say that was not why they made the change, but it certainly makes them look like a, a more important industry and in New Orleans. They we know a few years ago. the numbers when they come out. When yeah. they're big. A few okay. years ago, Mardi Gras faced the same issue. There was a, a chief administrative officer 
who insisted that the, the crews should pay money to help support the parades for police and sanitation. Crews said, look, we're already spending money on the parade. And so they got together and they hired a, an academic to do a study and did this for several years, doing a study about the Mardi Gras impact. I'm not sure if those numbers were always correct. And the fact is, there are some things you really can't measure that well. Uh, we, something like tourism, you can always measure hotel rooms. I mean, that's safe, okay? But people who just drive in for the day and all that and how much they spend, you can't. But, but we've seen this before about the tourism industry needing to kind of defend its numbers as a way of defending itself. When especially again today with what Mayor Cantrell was seeking and, and having to divert right. some of the money that goes to the hospitality industry, but to, she wants that money to go for the beleaguered sewage and water board. Right, and she's still definitely pressing for that. Um, you know, what kind of response now is she getting? Or are folks taking at least a look at it, those folks in Baton Rouge who need to make this decision? Yeah, actually, I'm, I've got a story coming Maria? out about it in The Advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, uh, there was a bit of a war of words going on. Uh, Steve Perry, the, who was the no, no. Uh, heads of New Orleans and Company, which markets the city, uh, had some very sharp uh, comments against uh, how money is spent in the city, particularly in the French Quarter. Uh, he toned down his words. The mayor had attacked him. She has stopped attacking him. And I'm hearing that uh, there are very uh, positive negotiations going on behind the scenes to try to come up with the money that she is seeking. And the governor is helping that out as well. Well, bottom line is we do have a lot of folks coming to town, that's for sure, a lot of tourists. I mean, are we getting to the point where there are too many? I, mean, I know there was some concern about that some years back. Are we just perhaps getting too many coming here? Um, yeah, and one of the questions that the, tourism, the hospitality industry faces is do they just keep the money just to promote the industry, the convention center, which has a big amount of reserves, just spend the money on their building? Or, you know, they also have a vested interest in making sure that the toilets flush, that the, there's sure. just no boil water advisory that if the city, if there's a big rain, that the, that there's not flooding. And again, I'm hearing that they are working towards uh, an agreement. Quick, can you touch on what the assessor is sort of floating out there about this proposed convention center hotel? Right. This is a related subject where uh, the convention center wants to build a hotel at the upriver side of the convention center, which is an area uh, that, that side of the convention center away from the French Quarter has very low occupancy levels. So the uh, convention center says the solution is to build a 1,200 room hotel. There would be uh, at, at a minimum of uh, $171 million of public su subsidies. Mm -hmm. Bureau of Governmental Research says $330 million, and part of the subsidies that the developers are, are in the convention center want would be to exempt, be exempt from property taxes by saying that a nonprofit would own the building. And Errol Williams, who's the assessor, who anybody in New Orleans probably knows him, mm -hmm. uh, who owns property, and he says, no dice. It, you know, this would be a, a, a privately operated hotel. There's no reason that they would be exempt so from no property exemption. taxes. So that really must impact the plans then. That would be costing them at least yeah. uh, anywhere from two to seven million dollars per oh, yeah. year. Okay. All righty. Thanks a lot, Tyler. Interesting stuff. Let's all right now go on over to Fletcher and mm -hmm. more interesting stuff. Okay. The Saints changing players, literally. Yeah, Mark Ingram, a guy who is kind of the foundation pillar or one of the foundation pillars of the Saints' recent resurgence, has, has now signed with Baltimore. Teddy Bridgewater is, is remaining in New Orleans, potentially to be Drew Brees' heir apparent. Those were the biggest moves in free agency this week. And uh, Ingram is the one that's kind of hard for me to digest because I, w I covered the team here since 2002. In 2013, the Saints went back to the playoffs. That was after Sean Payton had been suspended, the whole Bounty Gate situation. They got back to the playoffs in 2013. And then they parted ways with a lot of the guys who had been here since Payton got here. Roman Harper, Lance Moore, Darren Sproles, you know, Malcolm Jenkins. And, and I think they felt like we're secure enough going forward with drafting and signing free agents that we can turn the page on that generation of players. And Peyton has even said, as recently as the playoff game against the Eagles, that they made a huge mistake letting guys like Malcolm Jenkins and Roman Harper. They didn't truly value maybe their stats on the field, you know, didn't reflect the players they were in the locker room and what they were to their mm -hmm. program. And, and that's the one thing that worries me about Mark Ingram. Look, Mark Ingram's stats can be replaced. Alvin Kamara is kind of the, the bell cow running back, so to say. He and Michael Thomas are the up-and-coming young stars of the team. But Mark Ingram, look, I'm in that locker room three or four times a week, after games, before games. He is, he is kind of the embodiment of who they are, the heart and soul of what that team is. So I hope they didn't make a mistake 
by uh, by not being able to agree to terms because they were so close. I think Mark Ingram mm -hmm. overplayed his hand a little bit, expecting more money on the open market that didn't come. And I think the Saints, trying to protect themselves, signed a player named Latavius Murray, who's a good running back. But I just wish they could have probably come together, given it one more day, and they could have mm -hmm. probably found that happy medium. It just worries me a little bit. I don't think you're the only one, there, yeah. including you know, Saints players are lamenting his loss. That's true. I mean, obviously when, you know, a, a dozen or more players, guys like Teron Armstead, Cam Jordan, who's his closest friend, Alvin Kamara, are, are coming out and being pretty vocal about what his loss means, that's, that's a little bit concerning to the Saints. Now, again, look, they've had two fantastic years. You can make the argument they should have been in the NFC Championship game. Two years ago, except for not, except for the Minnesota Miracle last year, they should have been in the Super Bowl, except for the Nola no call. So they have good young talent. They've done a great job in recent years. Uh, a guy named Jeff Ireland, who's come on as the assistant general manager, has helped them with the draft and free agency, and they do have young talent. But I just hope it's not a repeat of a. 2013, 2014, when they let some of those quality veteran guys go and, and they regretted it on the back end years later. So One good thing but, but that strikes me as kind of unusual was signing Will Lutz, the, yeah. the place kicker. Was it like three years or so? Yeah. I mean, team. usually you don't sign place kickers to long-term contracts. Let me say this, same with Thomas Morstad. Thomas uh -huh. Morstad was at one time one of the highest paid punters in the NFL, but he's really good at what he does. What people have to realize is it was a joke in the media. Sean Payton's first eight years in the NFL, he had like 11 kickers. He had zero respect for kickers. You miss, you're gone. And, and they had, I mean, they really ran through guys left and right. I remember 2008, they had three different kickers. We were in, in London, and, uh, and a kicker named Taylor Melhoff signed before the trip to London, missed an extra point and a field goal in London, and we joked, is he even getting on the plane to come <laughs> back home? And then he got released the day they got back from London. So the fact that they have a guy now who is really good, who should have made the Pro Bowl, I mean, Will Lutz should have been the Pro Bowl kicker this year. I think that they feel don't let the good one go. It took us a long time to get to this point, so we're going we're gonna to compensate him and keep him just like we have Thomas Morstad. Okay, so we should keep an eye for more changes, you think? Coming yeah, I think for the most part. The good thing about the Saints is in recent years, you know, at least the last couple of years, they've drafted much better. So that has been where they've got their infusion yeah. of talent. And they haven't had to go spend big in, in really um, try to fill holes in free agency. So some of the subtle moves have paid off in a big way, like Demario Davis last year. And uh, in the moves this year, I think, could potentially, you know, fill the void, so okay. to say. All right. Thanks a lot, Fletcher. We're going to go over to Stephanie right now. Let's yeah. talk presidential politics and how's it yes. looking in terms of local support from, you know, politicians, politicians. here. Politicians. Well, of course, the Republicans will support Donald Trump unless something drastic happens. That is a given. But the Democrats are a little interesting. For the first part of the cycle, of course, the Democratic primary is going to be a free-for-all. Many, many candidates getting in seemingly every day. Some of them probably won't even make it till when voting starts, mm -hmm. but they're you know, they're coming a mile a minute right now. There was a lot of attention on Mitch Lander, of course, at the beginning when it looked like he might enter the race. It looks like now he will not. Uh, but he has said that his favorite candidate is Joe Biden, who appears to be getting ready to enter the race, mm -hmm. the former vice president, who would, of course, be top of the polls at this point, very well known, representing a certain segment of the party, the more traditionalist segment. Uh, the idea that maybe they can get some of those Trump voters back, where there are some other candidates who, whose idea was more get more new voters into mm -hmm. the system, maybe more liberal voters. What's interesting is that Cedric Richmond, another very prominent Democrat in town, um, the, the only Democratic member of the congressional delegation, likes Biden a lot, too. He went in on record in The New York Times. He didn't endorse him. It's too early for that. But he did say they've been talking on the phone. And he said he thinks Joe Biden is the Democrats' best chance to beat Donald Trump. And he actually said, this was last week, he said Joe Biden ha hasn't really decided, but I think he's not there yet, but I think he's there. Mm -hmm. So I think they have been talking. And he's they visited here in New Orleans. And it, I mean, I think that means two things. One is that Cedric Richmond is really somebody to watch in Democratic politics. People in politics think so. He just finished a term as the head of the Congressional Black Caucus. He's part of this next generation of Democrats that will probably move into prominence once Nancy Pelosi, Jim Clyburn, these people kind of in their 70s move off the stage. There will be, at some point, a big generational shift. There is an expectation he'll be part of it. So he's someone to court. Um, 
and also that he's playing the field a little bit. So he has really said he likes Joe Biden a lot, think he's the best chance, but he's also teaming up with Elizabeth Warren, mm. the Democratic senator from Massachusetts, who's also running. They have a big housing bill that they introduced last session. They just reintroduced it this week, and that would be greatly expanding affordable housing across the country. And the part of the idea is that Elizabeth Warren, who's very much a policy person, probably can't get it through the Senate, which is still controlled by Republicans, but maybe Cedric Richmond can get it through the House and really keep it alive and yeah, have some keep discussion. keep the discussion going. Um, and then and, um, former governor and former presidential candidate Bobby Jindal had some words about <laughs> one of the most recently he did. announced he Democratic candidates. He pops up every now and yeah. then and goes on and Fox you, and News. And you popped him. I, <laughs> he kind of... It was right there. So <laughs> what did you say, he Stephanie? Said, <laughs> so he was talking about Beta O'Rourke, who's the former Texas congressman who ran a very good race against Ted Cruz, the senator, but lost, and is now running for president. And Bobby Jindal said, he's my favorite kind of Democrat, the kind that loses. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have to look at Bobby Jindal and say, you know, you ran for president and you dropped out before anybody even voted. So maybe you know something about that. Takes one to know one. Takes one said. to know the a one a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Well, we'll one see. more thing I'd add that I'm th mm -hmm. back on the Democratic side that sure. I think might be interesting. The third major Democrat from Louisiana, of course, is John Bell Edwards, the governor. And I think it will be interesting to see how he handles the presidential race going forward. I don't think he'll say a word until re-election, if he is re-elected, because his part of his strategy has really been to distance himself from the National Democratic Party. But he's got some real um, attention in the National Democratic Party, even as he's distanced himself, because he, of course, is the Democrat who can win in the South. So a lot of people do look to him as someone who maybe could help in some more conservative states. So if he wins re-election, it will be interesting to see what but he does. But he's a guy who's totally out of step with the National Democrats on abortion S and with guns. Completely, yes. And if, are you suggesting, because I guess that does seem like a plausible thing, if yeah. it's somebody that is a little bit more maybe not as centered as Biden, if it is somebody like Kamala Harris yeah. or if it is somebody like Cory Booker, or, could yeah. he kind of balance them off as, it, as a vice presidential candidate? Um, is that even possible? There, there has been a little bit of chatter when people were looking at Mitch Landry, should they be looking at John Bell Edwards? Mm -hmm. I think what Tyler said is really important. I think he is too out of step is with he? the National Party mm -hmm. on those particular issues, so probably not. All right. And remember, by 2020, when the primaries are running around, John Bell Edwards will be either in his second mm -hmm. term or he'll be back in a meet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Practicing we're just, law with a shingle. Just yeah. beginning these, these discussions. All right, thanks a lot, Steph. Fletcher, back over to you. Oh, LSU yeah. basketball. What's yeah, happening? Bad situation, there? obviously. The head coach, Will Wade, has been suspended indefinitely um, because of allegations of a pay for play scandal. Um, the FBI has, has been conducting for more than a year. College sports is, is seedy. College basketball is the most seedy of, of them all. And uh, But according to a Yahoo report that he hasn't refuted, by the way, um, Will Wade was on a wiretap talking to a man about, in essence, buying a player, giving his family money, giving him money, saying he's going to make more than an NBA rookie, which are huge NCAA violations. Um, LSU took the proper steps to suspend him, especially because he wouldn't meet with F. King Alexander, the president of the university, or Joe Oliva, the athletics director, because his attorney advised him not to. So that doesn't exactly scream innocence to me. Um, the player, Javante Smart, who was the person who was allegedly receiving the money, um, has now been allowed to continue playing. Because again, there is nothing right now except for the wiretap that has been released. So if, if this player and his family say we never took anything and there is no credible evidence right now other than a wiretap, I, I think the NCAA and the school had to let him play. But Will Wade has been suspended, not because of what's happening, but because he won't talk to the university about it. I just can't see this ending ending well for Will Wade. You can't say things like that. You can't do things mm -hmm. like that and have it end in, in a good way. Is he saying anything right now? I mean, no, he released a statement saying that well, one, he wants to come back and coach, says that due process should play itself out and he should be allowed to coach until this, which is absurd if you don't meet with your bosses, to at least clear the air and explain what happened. Mm -hmm. How can you expect them to let you back on the court coaching? There's also um, in New York City, April 22nd, he will reportedly be subpoenaed to come testify in this FBI investigation into illegal antics in college sports, is, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what he says there once he is under oath and, and he's mm. questioned about this in, in greater detail. And the team, how's it doing right now? They lost on Friday in the SEC tournament, but they will go to March Madness. Um, 
and, uh, and play in the NCAA tournament, and they are very, very good. They have a ton of talent. Um, the only problem is, is in a year or two from now, they may have to vacate some of these wins in the regular season championship and anything they accomplish this year because their entire program could be tainted by this in a big way. It's going to be so right. Enjoy it now, huh? Yeah, enjoy it now, right, because it's, you know. And, and again, you know what? I hate to say this. I know it sounds so terrible. Um, you know, Reggie Bush had to vacate his Heisman Trophy, but I still think Reggie Bush won the Heisman Trophy. If LSU does make a run, I, I, I don't want to take it away from the team or the rest of the guys mm -hmm. on the team because their coach did some things that are illegal. Right. They'll have to vacate championships, and it'll be tarnished, but they're still a really good team this year. They are. I yeah. wish them all the luck. Okay, E, over to you. Hamilton, Hamilton mm -hmm. came to town, is in town. He is. And it's very <laughs> prestigious for New Orleans. I mean, this is probably the most famous performance show in the world right now. It's gotten... Uh, it's won all kinds of awards. It's a very, very popular show. And it's, it just speaks well for the town. I was thinking that uh, this year is a centennial of the greatest theater tragedy in New Orleans history. That was in 1919 when the French Opera House burned down, mm -hmm. which is not too far from where the, uh, the, the Orpheum is. And there was a reporter, Lyle Saxon's famous quote, that the, the heart of the French Quarter has stopped beating uh, as, uh, as, as he looked through the ashes of, of the French Opera House. And so it's interesting to see a revival of these theaters. Uh, you know, the Sanger was built as a grand performance house. Then there was a time when theater was kind of dying out and people were moving away from the city, and it converted into a, a movie house. And the same thing with the Joy across the street. Um, now the Joy is playing concerts like the other night. Okay, you had Hamilton on one side of the street and you had concerts on the other side of the street. And so there's a little bit of a, of a buzz of, of a theater community. A community not far away as the Mahalia Jackson. Now, the problem is that there's, there's probably more theaters than there are performances out there and, and, and people to go to them, but we certainly have the, the facilities. And proof that we, we, we can't deliver totally is that the, uh, the low State has never reopened. I don't think it ever will as a, as a theater. However, the Orpheum uh, did reopen, and that was pretty much uh, uh, the labor of one family that brought it back, and so that was encouraging and to see the symphony. And you're seeing all kinds of things like conversions, like church conversions. There's the, uh, uh, the, the, the Marini Opera House, which right. is a, a, a church conversion. Uh, uh, Southern Rep is now in the, what used to be the uh, uh, St. Rose de Lima Church, and they did a, uh, a nice job there. In Jefferson Parish, you got the new Jefferson Parish Performing Arts, mm -hmm. and then and then in Kenner, you have uh, Kenner Original Theater, which, which does mostly musicals. It's Rivertown. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Rivertown, but does good jobs with them. Does an excellent uh, job. Uh, and, so there's, and there's little, you know, a lot of small theater companies, too. But, uh, and so there's a lot of activity. I think New Orleans, that kind of, New Orleans attracts creative spirits. Your review on Hamilton, you saw it. I thought it was good, yeah. Uh, I thought the performance and the, and the singing were all good. Uh, the, the criticism people have is that some of the songs are kind of hard to hear. And if you don't know the history, you might kind of get lost. But even if you don't know the history, and if you can't totally understand the song, you can still just get immersed in just the spectacle of it all. I mean, it's a very good you performance. you saw it both in New York and here. I thought it was terrific. And I thought it was interesting that it's some of those New York theaters are very small. They're much more intimate. But this is a show that really fills up mm -hmm. the Sanger. And it was that was fun. All right. And it, it's running through, what, the end of the month? Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I think. And by the way, the, the Sanger is a good Broadway show house. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been to some of the Broadway theaters in, in New York, the Sanger is a lot better than a lot of those places. Mm -hmm. So it's a good place. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. Okay, Fletcher, one more time over to you. Okay. A couple of minutes now. Let's talk about the Pelicans. What's going on with them? Mercifully, the season will end on... <laughs> well, wait, wait, so you started no. with him with the Saints, and then, and then Ellis just the nose <laughs> and now the Pelicans. Right, we've gone, you know, we've gone, yeah. Right into the ground Good here. Good thing you're not asking about the Zephyrs. <laughs> <laughs> Baby cakes, right? Baby oh, cakes. Or, or Baby Zephyrs, cakes. yeah. The cakes, but back to the Pelicans. Yeah. They're going to have a new general manager. They, I, I think, could have a new head coach as well. The general manager will be able to decide Alvin Gentry's fate as head coach, and their team will look vastly different next season because they will trade Anthony Davis. Um, look, this is a horrible situation. It was completely mishandled by... Anthony Davis, LeBron James, and their agency. They share an agent. They colluded to try to get Anthony Davis to the Los Angeles Lakers. It's a horrible black eye for the NBA. Um, and it's it's kind of, it makes me happy to know that LeBron and the Lakers, I love LeBron James, but the fact that he's missing the playoffs for the first time since his rookie year is one ray of sunshine in all this <laughs> because they, 
Davis, LeBron, Clutch Sports truly destroyed two seasons. When when they pushed Davis to demand that trade, they torpedoed the Pelicans season. But when the Pelicans did not trade Davis to the Lakers, that destroyed the Lakers season. So it was a horrible, horrible move. It was poorly thought out by all of them, and they destroyed two seasons. But that being said, the Pelicans were probably going to make massive changes this summer. This at least got the ball rolling a few months early on them looking for general managers kind of you know, moving basketball to potentially some equal footing with football. I always joke here that we have this amazing fan base that's so well-educated in football that everybody speaks like hut-hut is their language. <laughs> but basketball has always played a, a secondary role. But I do believe that Gail Benson, this is a chance to kind of at least push it a little bit more to the forefront. And I think they, they will in some way this summer. It seems like the emerging star now is uh, Drew Holiday. He is. I don't know if Drew Holiday's ever going to be a star. Drew Holiday is a really, really good player, and he will pl he will play for years to come. But I don't know if I would call him a star, to be honest with you. So I think the package they get back for Davis, if they get four really good players to go with Drew Holiday, that could be very a very good. And that thing. could be the good side that yeah. whoever they they give up Davis for, they're going to get a lot. Without question, summer. they're going to get a king's ransom for him. And I would rather see them. I'd rather see five Drew Holidays. They were very top heavy with Anthony Davis and Demarcus Cousins. A lot of teams now in the NBA are better is the sum of all their parts than just one star here or there. So if they play this right, they could be a relevant playoff team as soon as next year. Certainly Gail Benson has high hopes for her team. She does, and I think she's very much invested in it. I think Tom bought it because it was a community good. It was an amazing investment. He bought it for $340 million. It's now worth a billion dollars. Wow. But I do believe that she is more invested in basketball maybe than he intended to be, and I think that's a, a really good thing. Look, if you think about the pit that the Saints – fell into, like the Mike Ditka season with only one, one game and the season after Katrina. And then what they rose to within a few years after that, yeah. it's possible. It can be done. It can be done. Yeah. Okay. And we need to look ahead now, E. An emerging issue in the Mid-City area, we're going to be hearing more about it, that the RTA wants to change the uh, streetcar service, wants to cut down on a lot of stops. Uh, and uh, the people in, in the Mid-City area are getting kind of up in arms about that. Part mm -hmm. of the idea is to make the, the trip a little bit quicker, mm -hmm. but also it's going to make the, the walk a little bit longer to catch a, right. uh, yeah, a streetcar. So you can be hearing more about this. All right, Steph. One of the questions when Chief Michael, speaking of Baltimore, we're losing mm -hmm. football players and police oh. chiefs to Baltimore. Michael Harrison was confirmed recently, and one of the questions was, would he take some of his top people with him? The answer is yes. Uh, today they announced that Deputy Chief Eric Chief of Staff Eric Melanson will become the new Chief of Staff. Deputy Superintendent of Compliance Danny Murphy will go to help oversee their consent decree, which is, of course, something that happened here. Uh, uh, so, so, All right. so we lost them in Ingram to Baltimore. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm on original. I always appreciate you all having me on, and I say the same thing the last few times <laughs> I've been here. I hope the Pelicans hire Trajan Langdon as their general manager, <laughs> the Nets assistant general manager, and I hope they hire Becky Hammond, the Spurs assistant, as their coach, and, and do something historic. You are consistent with that, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be doing some more reporting on uh, Latoya Cantrell's fight for more tourism dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a look at the convention center, uh, some of the, the ways they're planning to spend money. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you all for joining us. And, of course, we want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. See you.